Hello and welcome back into End on a Make. Uh, it's been a few weeks since I've recorded one of these. Mostly because the last video I recorded, I said, man, the Lakers look great and the Clippers look terrible. And then the Lakers got stomped by the Suns and the Clippers are a win away from the Western Conference Finals. You know, that's the game sometimes. Um, but I wanted to come back and talk a little bit about June 16th, uh, 2021 in the NBA. Because that day is going to be one that we will remember as NBA fans for a long, long time. So many crazy things happened all of yesterday alone. And I want to start with the massive comeback that the Atlanta Hawks had against the Philadelphia 76ers. You can say massive comeback. You can say epic collapse by the Sixers. Either way, um, the Hawks come back from 26 down in the second half to take a three-point win and a 3-2 series lead over the Sixers with Game 6 Friday in Atlanta. Now, this was a huge collapse for the Sixers. Um, ben Simmons has been scapegoated pretty relentlessly since then, uh, specifically because of his lack of aggression shooting and then struggles at the free throw line. He ended up missing 10 free throws in the game, which, uh, you know, in a three-point game, that makes a world of difference. And Sixers fans were very upset uh, all night. It was basically talk of, you know, hey, we could have traded him for James Harden. Uh, that offer was there when Harden was still in Houston. And... The 76ers opted to keep Embiid and Simmons together, and if they end up losing this series to Atlanta and getting eliminated, I think that's probably it for Embiid and Simmons as a tandem, um, which is crazy to think because it's been speculated for so long. You don't think about, like, oh, it could actually be here, but it might just be time. Uh, you bring in Doc Rivers. You bring in new man GM. You bring in Daryl Morey. You bring in this whole new regime. And then you have the same exact issues rear their heads at the worst possible moment. And, you know, that's you get to a point where there's, there's nothing else you can do. For the second half of that game last night, um, there were only two 76ers that scored a field goal for the entire half. It was Joel Embiid and Seth Curry who combined for like 73 of the team's 106 points. They absolutely carried. So the second half, it was field goals from those guys and then like a couple free throws from Ben Simmons. And then I think it was like Tobias Harris and I think Cork Maz had a free throw or two. So this was a huge collapse. And a big part of what, of what keyed this comeback for the Hawks, yes, Trey Young was incredible considering he has – you know, he had shoulder issues. He wasn't shooting the three very well. He was incredible at getting to the rim and at drawing those fouls. But this comeback really started with Lou Williams. So they brought Lou Williams in uh, in the third quarter, and then he played from the third quarter through to the end of the game. And in 22 minutes, he had 15 points and was a plus 31. A plus 31 in 22 minutes is incredible. He had three assists, two steals, 13 of his 15 came in the fourth quarter when they were making their run. And it's just, you know, it's demoralizing. And this was a Hawks team that was struggling all game. Herter and uh, Bogdan Bogdanovich were not out there for them at all during this run. Bogdanovich was in foul trouble and Herter, I don't think, had a field goal for the entire game. So when you're not, you don't get contributions from two key players like that, and you still have a comeback like this, it it can be demoralizing for, for Philly. And I can only imagine what Atlanta's going to be like on Friday for that potential closeout game. Like, Trey Young is really at a point right now with this Hawks team where they could end the 76ers as we know it. And I mean, I know that sounds, you know, like a lot of hyperbole. It sounds like a lot of overblown like oh man this is going to be so but like really where else would the Sixers go if it's you know I don't think they would just run it back uh, but that wasn't the only story that came out of uh came out of yesterday that would be crazy enough but of course not the NBA is is the world's most dramatically or the country's most dramatically the soccer is pretty dramatic um so the Clippers announced uh Wednesday morning that Kawhi Leonard was going to be out indefinitely with what is feared to be an ACL injury. Um, no more elaboration on it. He 
seemed to injure himself in uh, the closing minutes of game four, but he finished the game and then afterwards said he thought he would be okay. And then Wednesday morning before game five, they just were like, eh, yeah, no, he's not. He's out indefinitely, at least for the series, probably. And then who knows, depending on how the series goes. So no Kawhi. People were pretty quick to be like, all right, well, the Clippers, that has to be it for the Clippers, right? No. Playoff P decides to come through and silence the haters with a 37-point performance to help lift them past the Jazz, the number one seed in the NBA this season. And now the Clippers have a 3-2 series lead with the next game coming in L.A., a chance to close it out. And that's crazy. That's crazy because no one thought Kawhi was going to be hurt. No one expected the Clippers to win. And I don't think anyone expected Paul George to carry them the way he did with an over 50% uh, shooting performance. It, it, it's just, it's wild. We could see the Suns and the Clippers in the Western Conference Finals, two teams that have not been there and have not had a championship run really in franchise history. Um, and then... For the Suns, we got news from, from them as well that Chris Paul is now going to be in the health and safety protocols. He reportedly tested positive for COVID despite being vaccinated as like as and has been vaccinated for months, apparently. And now he's looking at potentially missing 10 to 14 days in the protocol, depending on how they manage it. And that's really weird. It's weird that, it you know, medical stuff, they seem to be very private with depending on the player if how much they want to share but like part of the the sell that the nba was putting out for players getting the vaccine was hey you'll have to you won't have to deal with as strict restrictions and rules and then now he gets the vaccine and now he tests positive and now like i don't know something doesn't add up with all of this so i'm hoping that it's like a false positive type of issue or it's something where He's able to recover quicker because the Suns have been an unbelievable success story this year. And people are so happy for Chris Paul and the success of this team. And if it's something where he misses like the first half of the series of the Western Conference Finals, that's going to be a huge blow for the team. And then also it just sucks for him. You know, we talk all the time about about legacies and, you know, He's one of the greatest point guards ever, but he can never get there. And like this is his one of his best chances ever to one of his best teams ever to and best chance to make a run like this. So I just really hope that that gets sorted out and we can find out, you know, what exactly is going on. We can get him back to the team before he misses considerable time. Uh, Sham Sharania says he's probably going to at least miss game one. Hopefully that ends up being all that he misses. Uh, but, you know. We don't know. We'll see what happens as more info gets put out on that. Uh, that's not it, though. They also announced, the NBA announced that LaMelo Ball had won Rookie of the Year with 84 first-place votes, uh, beating Anthony Edwards, who had the other 15 first-place votes, and then Tyrese Halliburton, who finished third. And, you know, this was a polarizing thing. A lot of people were happy that LaMelo got it because he was, like, the flashy, exciting player, and the Hornets were better than the Timberwolves were. There were things that, you know, Anthony Edwards played every game. He averaged more points. He had better shooting percentages. LaMelo just had more, you know, in the win share and then, like, assists and rebounds and stuff. So it kind of just feels like it was, like, your preference. I think it's a little weird that every award seems to prioritize games played. And then here we are with Anthony Edwards playing every game and LaMelo playing, I think he ended up missing like 25 to 25 or so games with that um, wrist fracture. So, I mean, yes, LaMelo was that big of a difference maker. I think the Hornets were also a little bit better of a team that didn't have to deal with as many injuries until the late part of the season. But it's all it's all preference and splitting hairs, so you can't be mad really either way. Um, I'm glad to see Lamelo come in and and meet the expectation and exceed the hype that was created for him before he before he was drafted. Because um, that's always it's always disappointing and like I always feel so bad for players when it's like the hype is super high and then people are like, well maybe we were wrong and it's been like one year. So there's that. Um, 
and that would be enough for any day, right? But no, because we also had all sorts of managerial and front office drama, starting with Don Nelson, a uh, longtime Mavericks GM, leaving the organization after 24 years. Now, an athletic article came out earlier this week that said that the Mavericks were in a very tough spot because there was all sorts of power struggles and drama going on behind the scenes and that that was impacting Luka Doncic's um, desire to sign a Supermax and stay long-term with the franchise. And Mark Cuban came out real quick and was like, uh-uh, that's garbage. I Nope. But uh, then the next day they fired Don Nelson after 24 years. And there's reports that um, Bob Volgaris, who has been like a, like an advisor, like in a type of operations role with the team for a few years, that he was going to be out as well. And that he was the source of all the drama that was happening with the team. Uh, that's been disputed as well. No one really knows yet, actually, if he's been if he's been relieved of his duties or let go or anything like that. Uh, so then, after that, we find out that Scott Brooks and the Wizards were unable to come to terms on a contract agreement. And Scott Brooks is gone now out of Washington after leading them to the playoffs this year. Um... So that's just, you know, that's another opening, and it doesn't stop there, because then Stan Van Gundy has been fired after one season as the New Orleans coach, which means that whenever they find their next coach for the Pelicans, that'll be the third coach for Zion in three seasons. So the Pelicans clearly are having a lot of issues with keeping up with, um, with Zion's development and putting the rosters around him. There was a report that came out now this morning that... Zion's family is upset with New Orleans and doesn't want him in the Pelicans franchise. Like, that's probably worst case scenario only three years into. Like, what a damning indictment of the franchise that three years in, his family's like, hey, this organization isn't going to win a damn thing while he's here. Uh, so the pressure's on them for sure to, uh, to figure something out and to find, like, they have to nail this coaching hire. And then they have to nail their offseason moves. Josh Hart has expressed desire for leaving and starting over. He's a free agent. Lonzo Ball um, is expected to leave as well and get a lot of high offers. And Zion and Brandon Ingram both have been very vocal about wanting to keep both of those guys, but specifically Lonzo. They both really, really want to keep Lonzo. And this was an organization that did not win a lot of approval from the team with how they handled J.J. Reddick's trade and departure, and that whole debacle earlier this year. So they really need to start doing things that are going to, you know, keep Zion happy and show that they're committed to moving forward and, like, trying to build towards uh, towards something. So who knows what that move is going to be as far as coaching goes. There are a lot of open open vacancies now with a lot of talented players because like 10 minutes ago before I hit record, the Mavericks announced that Rick Carlisle was stepping down as coach. He was going to, uh, he put out a statement that just said he's going to move on. He's thankful for everything. He thanked uh, Mark Cuban. He thanked uh, Dirk and Jason Kidd and a bunch of front office people. Did not thank Luca, but I mean, he's only coached him for two seasons, three seasons now. Um, so, Dallas saying, hey, no drama here. Uh, it kind of seems like things are falling apart over there. Uh, so there's a lot of openings. We have tons of high marquee teams. And then also a lot of young teams with a lot of talented young franchise cornerstone type players. Like this this is going to be a huge offseason both for rosters and then also for just for team structure. And finding the right coach in this sea of candidates is going to be crucial for these organizations like the Pelicans and the Mavericks specifically. Um, last thing from yesterday, to just put a cap on everything, uh, LeBron James took to Twitter after the Kawhi injury news broke and basically just called out the NBA and said, hey, I said this was going to happen when you said condensed season with a short turnaround time. I said there's going to be more injuries and it's going to be a worse quality game and you didn't listen and now look where we are. And this comes right after he had a couple tweets about um, Kyrie Irving when he got hurt. And he just said, you know, this sucks. Like, it, I'm paraphrasing because his tweet was just, I think, just the F word. And then, like, an angry face and prayer hands. Like, 
Uh, but LeBron basically put the whole league on blast and said, hey, I told you this was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen. I put so much time and effort into my body. I could have told you I was going to be hurt with this condensed schedule. And it's just crazy. I've just I've never seen so many things pop off at one. And this was all like back to back to back to back to back to back. Like it was all day. And then we got the incredible Hawks come from behind victory. And then we got the Clippers victory over the Utah Jazz without Kawhi. Like what a day. So if you're an NBA fan, um, please let me know your thoughts on on everything that happened or on what you think might be the uh, the biggest story to come out of June 16th in the NBA or what you uh, what you expect to come in the future. Like, are we done with all these big revelations or is this something where like this offseason is just getting started and we're going to have even more drama and shakeups before the finals have even taken place? Like, what is this offseason going to look like? If there keeps being this many, you know, shakeups and news stories and, and job openings and, and just all sorts of player movement and speculation, uh, let me know your thoughts. Let me know what you're kind of expecting or predicting to happen. Um, thank you for watching, and I will be back soon. I will be back sooner than three weeks, I promise. Thank you.